such a great uh, partner in telling this story. Like Kim mentioned, I'm originally from Great Falls, currently live in Helena with my wife who's from Helena, but her family is an old Butte family, the O'Learys. They grew up on Caledonia Street. Jim, Bill, uh, Margaret Therese, Joe. So got some Butte roots, uh, but with in-laws. And normally when I talk to people, I was out in Chicago a couple of weeks talking at the Newberry Library with one of my former students. There were Chinese people in Butte in, in Montana. <laughs> I was out uh, uh, last week in eastern Montana, Mile City, Glendive, and Billings. And Billings is a little bit knowledgeable about their Chinese community, but Mile City and Glendive, not so much. But this community here, you all know this history. You've got stories that, I'm, that I haven't told in the book that I'd love to learn from, but it's a knowledgeable, enthusiastic audience, so I really appreciate you coming out today. Speaking of in-laws, this story all started with a request from my mother-in-law, Lucille O'Leary. Now she's from Northern Idaho, but married Bill here in Butte. And when your mother-in-law gives you a request, what do you say? Yes, yes, yes ma'am. Ma yes, ma <laughs> and so she was walking around a cemetery in Helena, Montana, the Benton Avenue Cemetery. This was back in 2010, and came across this tombstone. John Arbitzer, native of Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Day he was born, day he died, young man. She was interested in the epitaph, though. Here he lies, his life cut short, his death avenged. She knew I was going to the Montana Historical Society to research something else, and she said, Mark, I'd like you to look into this story. Now, first of all, those of you who are familiar with cemeteries here in Butte, does this look like a tombstone from 1870? No, no it's definitely more contemporaneous. We know that Bitzer's family funded this in 18, I'm sorry, 1997. But the story in history was interesting, and so I dug around a little bit. No obvious Chinese connection here. But during this time period, I was teaching in Shanghai, China, and spending my summers with family back in Montana. And so she gave me this request as I was teaching in China, but visiting for the summer. What I found as I dug around a little bit is there was a Chinese connection to this story in Helen. And so what we have is a dead or alive reward request for the murder of John Arbitzer, Ah Chow. Uh -huh. This Chinese person definitely killed John Arbitzer on that night in 1870. Actually, didn't quite kill him that night because Bitzer lived for 14 hours, stumbled down to the Caillou Saloon where he was able to tell his side of the story, and no big surprise, Bitzer looked pretty good in his telling of his side of the story. He said he was walking by a Chinese man's cabin, heard a disturbance, went inside, found Ah Chow beating a woman, and ordered him to desist. Ah Chow left the room, came back with a pistol, and shot Bitzer. Bitzer then wrestled the pistol away from Ah Chow and went on his way. Well, there were other sides to this story as well, and another reward was issued, $150, not dead or alive, but catch him and turn him, turn him over to the authorities. Signed by Duck Ao Ye Wan and Tong Hing, the leading Chinese merchants of Helena. And so this Chinese story began to emerge. Turns out Helena in 1870 was more than 20% Chinese. And there were two different sides to this story. Some people in Helena, quite a few actually, believe the version of events that had Ah Chow coming home with Bitzer in his cabin forcibly dallying with his woman. And Ah Chow took appropriate action, shot Bitzer. Ah Chow didn't stay around to give his side of the story. He went on the run. We know Montana's vigilante justice at the, at the time period. He went on the run. But Montana did have a functioning court system by 1870. And so the Chinese merchants are saying, hey, catch him and turn him over to the authorities. Then let's have a trial. If he did it, great. If it was found to be justified, great. Let's, let's let the law system play out. What I decided to do that year in 2010 is to start my classes in Shanghai, China. I was teaching at a school called uh, Concordia International School Shanghai, a Lutheran-based Christian school in the middle of communist-controlled China, kind of an interesting little island, right? Um, but I had kids from all around the world. You can see I had kids from Norway, Ghana, Australia, Canada and many different Asian countries. Many of my students were Asian or Asian American. So I decided to start my year of teaching American history that year through the lens of this Bitzer Achao story. So it's called an inquiry-based project. I didn't know where it was gonna go, but I knew that I had access to the Montana Historical Society records, the maps, the photographs, things like that that you can see there, and my students would flex their historians' muscles by investigating and questioning and asking and hypothesizing and adjusting their assertions based on evidence. So back and forth and back and forth, and my kids loved it, and I loved it. We would go back and forth with the Montana Historical Society, they would send us records, here's Sanborn, fire insurance maps, those of you who know here, to try and triangulate where the cabin was, 
where Helena's Chinatown was, where the Caillou Saloon was, all of this type of stuff. What are they looking at here? Census. Census records, census records. And we thought that was gonna be an important lead. I thought this would maybe drive my class for one or two days. Turns out it drove it for about six months. Mm -hmm. And they were very invested in this. And so we would take 10 or 15 minutes at the beginning of each class before we went on to the other elements of American history that we had to cover. <coughs> it, the, the community just kind of caught hold of this and was very, very interesting. Now, the Bitsarat Chow thing is a pretty interesting story. The woman involved, there's some interesting tidbits about her and what happened to Chow. I'll let you read it all about it in chapter one. Okay. Uh, I gotta push my book, right? <laughs> but what we found is that Montana had a rich and deep Chinese history. Here's a map that I created with a cartographer when we were working on the book to try and locate where the Chinese were. I always get this question, how many Chinese were in Montana? What's my follow-up question? When? When are you talking about? The Territorial Census of 1870, the first official count, Take that number at about 10 to 12 percent of Montana's overall population. That's considerable. But I wanted a map that tried to show different time periods, different demographies, different chronologies, and different geographies. So we came up with these symbols here. The white triangle is when it was at its height in 1870. And so Helena had about almost 700 Chinese people in 1870, 20 percent of the total population. You can see down in Virginia City, it was quite big here. Now, we also have to realize this probably misses its height in Virginia City back in 1862, 63, 64, 65, with the mining boom. There wasn't really an official count yet. That count doesn't come until 1870. And so we tried to follow those census records and, and figure out when we could find the Chinese population in each locale at its height. Note, I cap this at 10 or more. So there definitely were Chinese throughout all of these regions in the small towns, definitely throughout here. One major gap here, though, is my hometown of Great Falls. No Chinese allowed. From the 1880s until about 1938, Chinese were barred from Great Falls. Great Falls is a planned city. Many other cities in Montana rose organically with natural resources. Great Falls is a planned city. It's got those rectangular grid streets, right? They also planned in the 1880s to not allow Chinese in. Finally, in 1938, when a gentleman from Butte, I'm sorry, from Helena, tried to go over, he's from the Wong family in Helena, you know, the House of Wong noodle parlors up in Helena. He tried to branch out and make a restaurant in Great Falls. He was an American citizen, born in Helena, tries to go over to Great Falls and make a, a restaurant. The Great Falls City Council had to meet to decide in 1938 whether they were gonna let him in or not. Okay, so that's an interesting other part of this story. Not a, not a proud part of the story, but interesting. Did they? Yeah. Um, by about 41, the Wongs were allowed to have, have restaurants there. You can see Butte here is about 841. I know that's a little bit of a controversial number here in Butte. I will say that each of these numbers is probably an undercounting for a couple of reasons. Census enumerators going around and interacting with the Chinese population that didn't speak English often, and they didn't speak Chinese. So there's probably an undercounting. And some of the Chinese were here uh, under less than legal means and would have definitely avoided interactions with government officials. But sometimes you'll hear the number of Chinese and you put it 2,500. Okay? The overall state population at its height was 2,500 in 1890. And so that's kind of a misreading and it does go back to the sources of a woman named Rose Hong Lee, who I know many of you are familiar with. My reading is that she just misspoke in her research and she was citing herself when you go back to the original, she says Montana had 2,532. A couple of years later, when she rewrites the book, she says Butte has 2,532. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that number comes down to us. But still, 840, 900, 1,000 Chinese people in Butte, that's a large Chinese community, the largest in the Rocky Mountain region, an important part of Montana and the region's development. You'll notice, though, I don't have the 1890 census on here. This is actually from a health officer's count in 1891. The 1890 census, the specific schedule records, neighborhood by neighborhood, have been destroyed in fire in the 1920s. <coughs> so when Montana's Chinese population was at, was at its height is when we actually have the least data about where they were individually and things like that. So that's obviously a tragic loss. But these numbers are just part of it. I wanted to go deeper and get past the 600 here, six here, 26 over here and know their lives, their goals, their struggles, their motivations, who they collaborated with, what pressures they were under locally, what pressures they were under from back home, 
And so we thought, well, let's turn to those census records and just try to build identities of each of these individuals. So we worked to mine the 1870 territorial census. It should give us gender, it should give us age, it should give us occupation, location, it should also give us their name, right? This is what the 1870 territorial census for Helena at least shows. <laughs> <laughs> so the racist term, China man, China woman, yeah. China boy, obviously the census enumerators didn't have the language abilities to communicate with this group and didn't try really hard. Okay, so maybe this was a brick wall, maybe this is all that we can know about the Chinese in Montana. I've got 43 minutes left to talk, there must be more, right? <laughs> they do rise in other records though. Oftentimes they rise as people to whom things happen, as the object of government action. And so we see these mug shots and these uh, newspaper accounts of Chinese being arrested and deported. This was very specifically from about 1903 to 1906, when Montana's Chinese population decreased by about 30% or more. Vigorous actions taken against Montana's Chinese population in 03 to 06. Roundups and raids across the state. That was because of uh, an eventual very vigorous enforcement of the Chinese Exclusion Act and its, its additions. But when things like this happen, when, we, when they rise to us in this way, maybe we get a name, maybe we get they were deported on this day, but we can't really build much of a story about them if we're only looking at them as the objects to whom things happen. And so yeah, they do rise in these ways, and we know about them because of these acts. So the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act is obviously the most famous and the most important. It sought to exclude Chinese workers, specifically. If you were a merchant, diplomat, student, teacher, something like that, you should be able to get in still, even after the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act. Very specifically against Chinese workers. However, earlier, Chinese workers had been welcomed in. In 1868, there was the Burlingame Treaty, which opened the doors wide, a treaty between Qing Dynasty China and the United States government, saying, please send us Chinese workers. What do we need Chinese workers for in the 1860s? Railroads, absolutely. The American West is resource rich and labor poor. So got a lot of laborers over there, come in and build these railroads. So it's confusing to them that at one moment they're welcomed and then another moment they're rejected. And that's what gave many of them the moral standing to say, well, we're gonna sneak in anyways. If you want us one day but not the next day, we've gotta make money to feed mouths back in Southern China. We don't really care what your racist laws, and the only law specifically targeting a nationality was this one. We don't really care what those say. But there were even earlier ones than this that are important to this story as well. In 1875, there was the Page Act, which basically treated all Chinese women attempting to get in as if they were prostitutes. Hmm. To be sure, many Chinese women in the American West did work as prostitutes. Definitely not all, and it's an overstatement to say that all or most did. But the 1875 Page Act sought to bar Chinese women from coming in. Now some people at the time period who were passing these laws gave the real reason. They said we don't want additional oriental families taking root here in America. Because Chinese could not become naturalized citizens. Butte's got a great immigrant past, an immigrant past of people who came here and became American, became Montana. Chinese could not do that, could not go through the process of naturalization. The only way to become a citizen if you're of Chinese ethnicity is to be born here on American soil. And so if you limit the number of Chinese women coming in, it's going to make it difficult for there to be Chinese American families take root here. Now you might say, well, Chinese men don't have to marry Chinese women. They could marry outside the race. Culturally, that from both sides, that was difficult. Legally, that was impossible from 1909 to 1950. Montana, there was something called the Anti-Miscegenation, Anti-Race Mixing Act that hemmed in the Chinese to only allow them to marry with Chinese, and there simply weren't many Chinese women here. In 1900, 40 Chinese men for every one Chinese woman. Okay, so this is intentionally done to make it hard for this group to take root here. That Chinese Exclusion Act, if I was a worker who got in before 1882, I should be fine. I got in legally, I should be fine, I should even be able to go back and forth between America and China. And there was a lot of movement between the two countries. Movement of letters, goods, money, and people. But the government kind of got wise to that. In 1888, they passed the Scott Act, which says even if you had gotten in legally, if you go back to visit, we're not gonna allow you back in. 
This stranded 20,000 Chinese men who were legally back home visiting family, trying to start families, right? And stranded them to not be able to get back into America. And then finally, the least known of these, which I focus on a lot in chapter three, is the 1892 Gary Act, a strengthening of the Chinese Exclusion Act. But the Chinese Exclusion Act had met Chinese migrants at the ports and borders. The Gary Act moved restrictions to the interior. Chinese were forced to carry on, if you were a, uh, a worker, Chinese were forced to carry with them at all times this document, about the size of an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, with their picture on it and with identifying details and the certificate number notarized by the proper state authorities. If they were found out of compliance with this, not having this piece of paper, they could and would be arrested and deported. Before this in 1892, the only group forced to be photographed were criminals. Hmm. These Chinese people are not criminals. They're being forced to be photographed. In essence, you're criminalized, not you, sorry. <laughs> the government is, is criminalizing being of Chinese ethnicity. So that Gary Act was very important, but the Chinese did fight against that in Montana and nationally, and that's a, a pretty interesting story. But they do rise to us in these records, but only in this way, with a caricatured Uncle Sam taking out a caricatured Chinese person, and if we only find them in the records in that way, we can't really get their identity, their voice, their hopes, their dreams, their motivations, their collaborations. We can only see them as people to whom things happen. So we needed to try and go deeper. But even with that, there are some interesting stories that rise in that. I want to get beyond this. I want to get to know him. I want to know him not as the anonymous Chinaman of the 1870 census, or not as the object of Uncle Sam's boot, I want to know him. Does he look capable of deep thought and intellectual discourse? I want to know his hopes, his dreams, what obstacles he faced, how he sought to overcome these, how complex he was intertwined with Montana-based events, nationally events, and global events. What can we know? We do know this Butte Chinese resident. We have his name and we have kind of what he was involved in. A source that we, that we found says, there is a state lecturer who visits the societies in other cities. That already tells you. Societies, what are we talking about? They're organized, they're working for a cause, and has spoken to all of them with the exception of the one in Missoula. That tells about us an interconnection in the state. His name is Housey, and is at present in Chicago. He will return in about two weeks, and then we'll visit Missoula. Okay, he's moving, he's shaking, he's trying to shake things up and do something with these societies, but is he alone? No, he's part of this group. And I'll, I'll take note here, this is not a mugshot. They sat for these photographs and they determined how they wanted to appear in these photographs. You'll see some of them are in traditional Chinese hairstyle and traditional Chinese dress, while others have adopted Western hairstyle and Western dress. They all have this lapel pin. Some of them, though, have a second lapel pin, pin that is an American flag. And I like this guy in particular. Western dress, what do you note about his hair, though? He's got the... He's got the cue, but he's not clean shaven. I think he's in the moment of going away from Chinese-style hair and dress over to, I'm fully in this American camp now. Okay? But these weren't just the nine gentlemen here. It's a larger group. It's a group called the Chinese Empire Reform Association. The Chinese emperor up here, the Guangxu emperor, he had tried to westernize and modernize China so that China could compete on a global scale. Japan had done that, and Japan was a player at the time period. Japan actually defeated Russia in 1905, but China was weak and had not taken on technologies and Western ideas. So when he comes to power, he tries to do that. The person who had been in power before him, the Dowager Empress Sushi, his, his aunt basically, didn't like that, came back into power, threw him in house arrest where he would stay until his dying day. They don't know this yet. And so they're saying, we want to try and put him back in control, westernize, modernize, strengthen China, because a strong China back home will protect its citizens abroad. The Japanese in Montana and the American West were not picked on nearly as much as the Chinese were, because Japan wouldn't allow them. And so if China could become stronger, maybe Chinese in America could enjoy that strength. So this group was in Butte. This is the Chinese Empire Reform Association of Butte. But it really was across the state. <coughs> Billings, Helena, Marysville, Montana. 
They had branches across the state and they were interconnected and trying to strive for these goals. A college, reform, change the language, actually in Butte. In about 1903, 1904, 1905, there was a group of these men who were forming a militia with real rifles, training with real live ammunition to try and nominally take back China and, and uh, put the Chinese emperor back in charge. But think about that, in the streets of Butte, down on the flats, these Chinese men are arming themselves and training with real ammunition. Right? That's a pretty bold thing. I assert this is a global institution. It had branches in Canada, Mexico, Burma, Australia, Japan, Singapore. I assert that Montana had the greatest critical mass of branches of the Chinese Empire Reform Association in the world. It's a pretty interesting wow. story. But to tell this story, you just not only need to know Montana history, you also have to understand Chinese history. So that's one of the points that I try to make in the book. I want to come at it from a Chinese historical perspective, a Montana historical perspective, a world historical perspective, and bring those things together to understand the experiences of the Chinese Montanans. And that experience often was painful. This gentleman is a Billings resident. His name is Chen Bo. And he got in legally. He was a merchant. And so he got in after the Chinese Exclusion Act. He was trying to do his merchant thing. But business wasn't quite so good. And so he did start working not just as a merchant, but also as a day laborer. Well, when he was found to be doing that, that's out of compliance. He was arrested. Didn't have the proper paperwork that a, a laborer should have. He was arrested, and they were going to send him back. But he spoke back to power. I won't attempt this pigeon English that the Billings Gazette put into his mouth. I think I want to give him more dignity than that. But he says, hey, the American man tries to make the Chinese man go back home when the Chinese man believes he has a right to stay here. But the Chinese man will boycott American goods and tell the people of his country how he was treated here. So this boycott sounded kind of interesting in 1905 when I dug into what that story was. Turns out what the Chinese were doing globally, they had fought against Chinese exclusion morally. They had said to, said to Americans, hey, you're letting everybody else in. All these other immigrants groups you're letting in, it's not right that you exclude us. <coughs> that moral argument hadn't worked. They would fought it legally, taking it up to the Supreme Court. That hadn't worked, so now they wanted to fight it economically. Then they issued a boycott of American goods back in China. Montana was very interested in tapping into the Chinese market sending Montana wheat over to China, our farmers, their eyes got very big at that prospect. But the Chinese are saying, we're not going to buy anything American until you soften treatment of the Chinese, maybe even repeal Chinese exclusion. So I dug around into this story and found this source from the River Press in Fort Benton. If you don't read the River Press very often, this is an unusual <laughs> thing to appear out of Fort Benton. It's obviously a placard in Chinese, calling for the Chinese in Montana and across the world to boycott American goods. Hmm. And it says, he who does not support the boycott is a cold-blooded animal. Right? And it worked. This boycott actually had an effect. In 1906, President Teddy Roosevelt softened the treatment of Chinese attempting to get into America. Before this time period, for a small window, the Chinese tried to get in. At, at ports of entry, Angel Island, places like that, they would be stripped down, every inch of their body measured and photographed. <clears throat> so that if they went back home, they could be sure, the immigration officials could be sure you're who you said you are coming back in. But how undignified is that, right? And you're not criminal, you're just trying to immigrate with the proper paperwork. And so they fought against this, Teddy Roosevelt repealed that because of this boycott transferred the most stubborn and racist immigration officials away from ports where they would deal with Chinese immigrants, didn't end Chinese exclusion, but this had a major impact <coughs> by these guys working in Billings and Fort Benton and Butte and places like that. So even when we find them as objects to whom things happen because of American laws, we can find stories of strength. That takes us a little bit closer to home. The unofficial mayor of Butte's Chinese community was a man named Quan Loy. And those of you who know your Butte history, as you all do, there was a major attempt at a boycott of Butte's Chinese. There had been attempts in 1885, 1892. But in 1896, 97, it got serious. And many of the white-controlled labor unions in Butte tried to boycott Butte's large Chinese community at that moment, trying to make it so that people would not go in and frequent the noodle parlors, 
use Chinese laundries, and so they'd have walking delegates, they call them, standing outside saying, you're not gonna go into this Chinese restaurant, you're not gonna go in and use this Chinese laundry. And the Chinese would deliver meals and deliver laundry. The uh, boycotters would follow them to the place where they delivered it and try to tell that person, you need to stop using Chinese services here. Quan Loi and the others of this fought this, tried to fight it through the courts, and actually circulated a petition in Buse Chinatown, here you see one page of it, where more than 300 members of Buse Chinatown signed this saying, fight, fight for us in the courts. We can't all appear, but Quan Loi, Hum Fei, others, please fight against this in the Butte court system. They secured Wilbur Fisk Sanders, a lawyer out of Helena, he came down and fought, and they actually won an injunction against this type of treatment. Major victory in the late 1890s. Now why do I kind of speak positively about that boycott of 1905 where the Chinese forced better treatment, but negatively about this one? Well, the boycott that the Chinese launched was about a policy. The boycott that was launched here was more about the color of your skin, your language, your culture, things you couldn't really change. Right? Same economic method, for maybe two different purposes. Quan right? Loi went on to fight for other things, though, as well. The Chinese desperately wanted to keep their culture alive, their religious traditions alive, things like Chinese New Year, things like Tomb Sweeping Day that the Meiwa Society still keeps alive in Butte today. And they wanted to keep that alive, but that could attract negative attention. And so Quan Loi fought to try and keep things alive that the Chinese needed culturally and religiously. Specifically, with regard to what happened after Chinese people died in Montana. They would be buried with great fanfare, very loud, a lot of, a lot of different things going on in the, in the ceremonies. They gained a lot of attention, and at times animosity. The idea was that their bones would never reside permanently outside of China. So five to seven years after they'd been buried, they'd be exhumed, the bones would be cleaned and sent back to southern China for reburial in their home village so that descendants could venerate the ancestors. If that didn't happen and, and the veneration did not happen, it was thought that the spirit wandered as a hungry ghost. So it was very important to take these cultural rituals seriously, but not everybody in Montana liked it. Okay, here you see an article from out, out east. Actually, Billings served as the collection point for Chinese remains from eastern Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, and Nebraska. A pretty important role. Butte and Helena did that here, and bone pickers would come through and communicate with the Chinese leaders, probably Quan Loi, one of them. But he met some opposition in trying to keep this ritual alive. A pretty important Montanan fights against him. Montana Attorney General, the first Attorney General, Henri Haskell, commented on his perception of Chinese residents unwilling to allow their dead to remain in America, noting this practice as evidence of their opposition to assimilation. Quote, these Chinese are not bona fide residents in any sense of the word. They will not even permit their bones to have sepulture in our soil, end quote. For many who harbored anti-Chinese sentiments, this cultural practice served as further evidence to justify the ongoing prohibition against Chinese citizenship. <clears throat> Answering this criticism, Quan Loi of Butte compared the desire to have remains returned to China as similar to Montanans who shipped their dead back east to rest closer to family members. Quan noted that, quote, the bodies of his countrymen are shipped back to China for the same reason that the bodies of Eastern people who die here are sent back east, that they can be laid to rest beside relatives. So we have these moments where there's attempted opposition, but strength in standing up and speaking back against that. This gentleman is from Helena, Lee Sam Fong. I mentioned that, um, I mentioned that Gary Act of 1892 that forced them to be photographed and carry this photograph at all times. This is the only Gary Act certificate that I found. Now there would have been thousands of them for Montana's Chinese community. This is the only one that I found at the Montana Historical Society. You'll see it's noted as March 1894, but the act was actually passed in 1892. Well, that's because the Chinese fought against it for two years before they were finally forced to register. Lee Samfong had a history of standing up for himself and trying to prove his ability to reside in Montana. So he not only carried this after 1894, but he carried another letter written in 1890 that was signed by 22 prominent Montanans saying that Lee is an upstanding Montana, an upstanding Chinese resident of Helena. 
Signing this were a couple of former governors, a couple of current and former state Supreme Court justices, the Episcopal Bishop of Montana. So Lee was a connected dude. Right? Not all the Chinese in Montana had these connections. The reason Lee needed this and the other documentation, though, is because he knew he had to go back to China but still work in Montana. The reason he had to go back to China was to find a bride. He couldn't find a Chinese bride here. And so in 1893, Lee travels to China. <coughs> Lee traveled to China in 1890, married, and brought his wife to Montana. In 1893, the Lees welcomed a daughter. Here's two of his daughters. Helen in newspapers reported it was, quote, the first Chinese baby born in lawful wedlock in Helen. Lee sought the help of local firemen to summon the doctor and to assist in delivering the baby. The article joked that the firemen, quote, feared that the U.S. Marshal will be after them for having assisted in bringing a Chinaman into this country. Yet the article acknowledged that birth in America equaled citizenship, which was not available in any way to the parents of the newborn. She can go to China and return as she pleases, being an American citizen, it said. American citizenship conferred far more rights than being able to travel back and forth to China. Lee and his wife went on to have three more daughters. When they exercised their rights as American citizens, Montana newspapers took note. Montana women earned the right to vote in 1914, making the state an early adopter of women's suffrage. In 1916, the Lee daughters gained attention by exercising this right, but not without questions about the legality of their doing so. Upon applying to register to vote, the clerk at the county office, quote, was not sure that they were entitled to registration, end quote, due not to their gender, but their ethnicity. After the issue had been raised to the county attorney, it was finally determined that they were, quote, qualified under the law to have all the rights of other women in the state. Asked for whom they would vote, each sister said she was going to vote for the best man. <laughs> in fact, they had the opportunity to vote for a woman in the election of 1916. As you all know, Montana's Jeanette Rankin had worked to gain the right for women to vote and was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives that year. This part of the story, telling the history of Montana's Chinese women, was particularly hard to do. There's very few sources on Chinese men. There's even fewer sources on Chinese women. But I think I was able to tell it in some interesting ways, and some Butte stories feature prominently in them. There's uh, women who've been extricated from prostitution in San Francisco, who have been married to Butte gentlemen here. There's kidnapping attempts and back and forth. There's some interesting stuff that happens with the Butte families here. As I did this research, though, all that I've talked about before was mostly in English language sources. But every time I dug into the archives, a new scrap emerged that I thought, interesting. That's interesting. There's something there. But I couldn't read it very well. These documents are more than 100 letters, maps, prescriptions, bills that date from the 1880s to the 1920s, written from southern China, Guangdong province, specifically Taishan County, this very impoverished, very hard on its luck county where the vast majority of the Chinese who came to Montana and America were from. So they're written from family members back there to a gentleman working in Butte. Now, these letters were saved through the Maywa Society, through the Maywa Building. I think as Butte's Chinatown shrank and people left, they left things behind and those things were pushed into the Maywa Building and the Wachong Thai Mercantile. But in the 80s, the Maywa didn't have the museum going and the ability to really preserve these things. And so they were in danger of being destroyed through leaks, through possible vandalism, arson, things like that. I believe Hal Waldrop is the key reason that these documents still exist. Right? Hal's here today, and I appreciate his work. And so I think the conversation went, you saw these documents, tried to figure out who could preserve them, approached the archives here, and they said, these are interesting, but we don't have the means to preserve these yet. And then also talked to the Montana Historical Society, where thankfully they've been preserved since then. In the 80s, there was an attempt to translate some of these. A couple of letters were sent to a guy working at the University of Montana who uh, read Chinese, he's from northern China. And he read these documents, a couple of letters, and he said, they deal with family issues, there's nothing of true historical importance. I agree with them on the first part, I disagree with them on the second part. I think there is a story of true historical importance here. The person working here, we call him De Chuan, that's probably not how he went, and we've never been able to find him in other records. I think he probably was here under less than legal means, maybe as a paper son, meaning he maybe had bought another person's identity who did have the ability to get past immigration and into America, but he was pretending to be that person. 
So I think he would have gone by one name with immigration and government officials here, but his family knew him as a different one. And they write back and forth. And the way that we were able to translate these, so like you know, I was working in China at the time, came across these documents and said, oh, I know a bunch of Chinese people, they'll be able to read these quite easily. And I sent them to some of my Chinese colleagues and they could read about 30% of it. Well, the reason is, is they're written in a hard to decipher calligraphy and they're written before the 1950s. In the 1950s, with the communist victory in the Civil War, they simplified the written form of the language to try and spread literacy, and it worked. China has massive literacy to this day. It also, though, divorced about 1.4 billion Chinese people from being able to read these documents from the 1880s. So I need a certain type of Chinese person, either of a certain generation, so we worked with some grandparents in this process, or more specifically, families from Taiwan and Hong Kong, where the traditional form of writing is still kept alive. When the communists and the nationalists were fighting, the communists won Cape mainland China, the nationalists fled to the island of Taiwan, formed their own government. They were the elite, and they kept that elite language alive still to this day. <coughs> Thankfully, at the school that I was working at, I had a few families from Taiwan, a few families from Hong Kong. Here you can see some of the sons and daughters there. And so working with grandmas and grandpas and these families, we put together some programs to try and translate these documents. I wrote some grants brought my students to Helena, Montana. Pretty cool to get to bring my students from Shanghai, China to Helena, Montana. We actually lived at my cabin in Wolf Creek, Montana, and to get to show them Montana. As we were working here, our, re our translation team was working back in Shanghai to try and unlock what these letters could tell us. It was a, an amazing experience, and I'm still in touch with many of these, these students. I was with this student a couple of weeks ago. She now works at a major research library out in Chicago where we told this same story. And this is 12 years on, so it's been a fun, continuing relationship. But what we find about these letters is the pressures that they were under from home. Again, times were very, very tough. The 19th century in this part of China, earthquakes, flat famines, floods, epidemics, foreign incursions, horrible civil wars, times were tough. The men who went out, and it was mostly men, as I've talked about those reasons, the money they were earning here and in Livingston and in Helena and not in Great Falls, right? The money they were earning and sending back home was life. It wasn't just for frivolous purposes. In fact, the saying said that when the ships don't sail, the fires stop burning. <clears throat> Meaning that if there was an interruption in the flow of goods, the cooking fires literally stop burning. An estimate in 1930 from a study done said that 80% of family income in this county of southern China was foreigner. And so the money they're earning here in restaurants, in noodle parlors, and things like that was life. So that the letters, what they testify to, are the pressures that this man was under and that this community was under here in Montana. And they are peppered with send more money, send more money, send more money, send more money, come home and get married, send more money, come home and get married. <laughs> it was a cultural imperative, and still is, to have children that can pass on your family line and then can venerate the ancestors after they're gone. I don't think our guy was able to go home because I think he was here in less than legal means and I think he wanted to chance as little as possible interactions that might cut off his flow of income to keep people alive back in southern China. His brothers and cousins had been sent out as well. Some were working in Kansas City and in New York and in the Philippines and places like that. And there was pressure from that as well. They all knew their obligations. But one of them was not upholding his part of the deal. He was named De Xu. So our guy here in Butte we call De Chuan. And De Xu has disappeared. He's not sending money home. They're worried about what's happened to him. And so we hear from the letters. I still cannot find where Brother De Xu is. No news and no money. As soon as you get information about him, please sit right so that we will not not worry too much. You left our country for more than 20 years. Our family eagerly expects you to come back according to the original plan. It will be best that you get married here. You can have offspring for our forefathers and glorify our family. It is a fundamental family tradition. Dushu eventually does reappear, but he's penniless and not taking care of his responsibilities. I hope you won't be like Dushu, who does not care for his parents and his ancestors' incense. He wanders outside and has changed his name. When he meets brothers and cousins, he is sorrowful and ashamed. 
I'm writing today to tell Brother De Chuan here that in our village, there's a piece of land with a house on it. Brother has been working outside the country for many years. I presume that you have a great flow of income from your very good business and that your hands are covered in gold. Mm -hmm. I'm writing today to tell Brother to decide on buying the house. We have to think about each other. Be a man, my brother. Hands are covered in gold. He's working on the laundry here. Now, maybe relatively speaking, he was wealthy. The documents we translated tell us that he was going into deep debt here to send every penny he could back home. And the letters do testify that he was sending money home as much as he could, but it was barely enough to keep people alive. We never hear of his father. I think his father probably passed before the boys went out and before these letters happened, but we do hear of his mother. So we get these accounts. Our kind mother is in very old age, towards the last few years of her life. If you've made your fortune, please come back home. This way we can repay mother the grace of her parenting, and our brothers can sit together, chat, and enjoy being together. We have one letter. <coughs> Last month I was very sick, but luckily the illness is cured. However, I'm not completely recovered yet, thus money would be helpful. I only wish for your health, but please work hard. How many moms have either thought this or written to this to kids working in view? Don't waste your time wandering around in casinos or red light districts. <laughs> when you get money, regardless of the amount, return home immediately. After that, you may return to work. Mother is so old and weak now. When you have enough money to purchase a boat ticket, I hope that you can come home to visit and comfort her. It is our biggest wish to see you come home. Now, Dushu is living at home with his mother, not bringing in much income, and he eventually writes to tell Brother De Chuan, who's been floating the family for this long, this. <clears throat> our mother had been sick since last year. Sadly, she passed away the evening of September 18th last year. Sorry that I didn't let you know earlier. It's April, and he's writing about mom's death in September. Please forgive me. When mother was sick, we deposited money for her treatment. It was not enough, and we still owe. We did receive your 100 silver yuan on April 7th. I'm also thankful for the 20 silver yuan you sent to me. Since we still owe money to others, could you please let us send us more so that we can clear our debts? How I hate that money, mother has no money for burial. So the pressures he was under here were immense, from home. We also know life wasn't easy here, surrounded by an often hostile non-Chinese environment. And so he's got these pressures back and forth. And honestly, this is a micro-history. This one chapter is a micro-history of this one man. But we can extrapolate to infer that about many of the Chinese working in Butte, in Montana, and the North American West. So that was one collection of the documents. The next collection, I think, is maybe more exciting because we can extend the telling of Montana's Chinese history into time periods that normally don't get focus. Normally, we're the 1870s, 80s, 90s, turn of the century. We don't take the story very much past that. And so we've got these stories, again, thanks to Hal, from this gentleman, Hong Wing Hong, Wing Hong Hong. I assert that this guy was the first Chinese miner in view. Now, that's not what you'd expect the first Chinese miner in a Montana town to look like, right? Well, in Butte, obviously the mining history is key. The Chinese were barred from working in the underground mines in Butte for 60 years. We all know that, that image that has like uh, no smoking in how many different languages? Mm -hmm. Doesn't have it in Chinese, right? The Chinese were not allowed to work in the underground mines in Butte. This gentleman did break that color line in 1941. Why 41 would Chinese all of a sudden be allowed to work in the mines? The war for three reasons. <clears throat> Copper production increased, demand increased, manpower decreased as men went off to fight, but also the Chinese were our allies against the Japanese in World War II. It'd be pretty unse unsightly to be barring people you're allying with from things like that. And in 1943, the Chinese Exclusion Act was finally he had gotten in earlier. He'd gotten in at the age of 14 when he came to Butte in 1933. And when he came through, he came through Seattle. He and his uncle were detained for six weeks and peppered with hundreds of questions to try and prove who they actually, that they were who they said they were. Detained for six weeks as a 14-year-old boy in Seattle. Wow. And they would ask him these questions and then they would send off to Kansas City and New York and Laramie, Wyoming. And they would compare the answers that he gave as a 14-year-old boy to answers that his grandfather had given decades earlier when he came in. 
How many steps is it from your ancestral house to the pond? There's how many pictures are there in the front room? Are they hung on the wall or are they leaned against the wall? I couldn't answer that about my mom and dad's house right now, right? But there was these efforts to try and keep the Chinese from coming in. And there, were free, there was a, a common sense in the government that the Chinese were incapable of telling the truth. The guy who was in charge of his brother's fate, this man named Everett Drumright, US consul in Hong Kong, when investigating claims of Chinese trying to get out of Hong Kong and into America, said, we can prove fraud in 85% of the cases and we assume fraud in the other 15%. He thought the Chinese were incapable of understanding the bonds of an oath and incapable of telling the truth. Well, that's important for us because of these letters. More than 250 letters saved from the period 1930s to the late 1950s. And they deal with our guy Wing Hong Hong here in Butte and his brother Wing Goon Hong in southern China. His brother is desperately trying to get out of war-torn southern China and into safety here in America and maybe Montana. War-torn China, why war-torn China? Well, there'd been the communist nationalist civil war since the 30s into the 40s, and the Japanese had invaded, and after the Japanese had been defeated, the communists and the nationalists went out of the game. Particularly damaging to southern China and particularly damaging to Taishan County. After the Japanese were defeated, more than 250,000 civilians were not findable. They were dead or had migrated. And so families working here couldn't find relatives back home. So Wing Hong is trying to get his brother into America, his brother whose claim should rest on exactly the same evidence that got Wing Hong in should get Wing Goon in as well. And so when we translated these letters, they speak to the family <laughs> trying to reconnect, trying to survive. And the time frame is important. Wing Goon first writes in July 1949. And he's optimistic. He says, brother, I am now in Hong Kong going through the process of applying to go to the US. All the formalities should be completed within a short period of time. When you see this letter, arrange a passport so that I can start working on it. Best wishes, younger brother, Wing Goon. This is July 49. He writes in November 49. I would like to know the status of my application. Is it proceeding? Please be honest with me. Let me know if I've done anything wrong. By April of 1950, if the passport application is successful, please send it to me immediately so that I may proceed. Right now, the US-Soviet standoff, the Cold War, is at a deadlock. At any provocation, war might begin. Please, brother, send it quickly so that obstacles can be avoided. Started in July 49, now we're to August 53. I beg you to find a powerful Westerner and ask him to be the guarantor of my documents. Please ask the Westerner with his reputation and authority to write a request to the Department of State to accept my application to go to America. Brother, I beg you, I'm in a dire situation in Hong Kong. My present chance is slim. Our guy here in Butte did find a powerful Westerner, Senator Mike Mansfield, and tried to employ him for help. Mansfield tried to help the brother get in, but was rebuffed. Four years after that request, and now we're in 1957, <coughs> My humble brother, you are away from home, but are lucky and healthy, holding stable work and earning well. Your brother here is still safe, luckily. From last August, when I went to the US consulate to give the materials and wait for the investigating process for approval to come to America, I heard nothing. I really don't know the reason. This makes me have the feeling of waiting eagerly without a clear chart. There are several countrymen like me, none got the letter in. Dear brother, I hope you can instruct the office as fast as possible to help you get the chance to go to America. I'm deeply thankful for all the efforts you make and the precious time you spend. Later, when we meet again in America, I will thank you directly. They never meet again in America. Mm -hmm. Brothers are never reunited. Even though Chinese exclusion has been ended, what took its place was red scare and a fear of communist infiltration. And so guys like Everett Drumright in Hong Kong, expecting every Chinese person to be unable to tell the truth, they also claimed that the Chinese resisted Americanization and would not assimilate, would not put down roots, would not become American. Well, you know the reasons why. Families weren't allowed, they weren't treated well, they were arrested and deported. But I think our guy in Butte actually became an American, not just an American, a Montana. Here's Wing Hong Hong. Proud outside with his new car outside the Maywa building. Probably fishing, I think. What lake do you think that is? 
Georgetown. I think maybe Georgetown. I want it to be Georgetown, right? <laughs> and he's got, this is not a Chinese guy. These are a couple of Chinese guys. They've got friends. Here he is harvesting a, probably a white-tailed doe there, right? This is not Wing Hong Han. This is from the Butte archives here. This is the first Chinese-American Boy Scout troop in Butte. <laughs> so those claims that they resisted Americanization, that they wouldn't assimilate, they weren't given an opportunity to do this. They weren't allowed to have families form here and go from being Chinese to being Chinese-American. I think he did. I think he became a Montana. He did the most Butte-America thing you could do. In 1941, he actually joined the labor union at the Mountain Con Mine, hmm. right? And he's sharing his lunch back and forth. We have a, an excerpt from his diary, sharing his lunch with the white workers. He's got a Finnish partner. They get in an accident. They fill out an accident report. He's Butte. He did leave Butte in about 1958, though, went to Seattle, I think because the requests to advocate on his brother's behalf were constantly pulling him to Seattle and filling out paperwork and affidavits and blood tests and bone scans and all this stuff. I think it pulled him to Seattle. Plus, in 57, copper prices dropped considerably. Mountain Con laid off a bunch of workers. He might have been one of those workers. He goes up to Seattle where he worked as a machinist out in Seattle for the rest of his life passes away in November of 2000. That's, that's current events, wow. right? And so there's a connection still. And this, I'm excited because this allows us to tell the history of Montana's Chinese further into the 20th century than I've ever seen it told. Really. And so the Wing Hong Hom story is a key piece to that with the letters translated and that family tension back and forth. He's desperately trying to get his brother to join him and get his brother to safety. He wasn't given that opportunity. And so I want to get to a point, and I hope I did get to a point, where we can understand the Chinese in Montana not as the anonymous Chinaman of the 1870 census, not just as numbers on a graph or a map, not as objects to whom things happen in terms of arrest and deportation, but we can give them their identity, their dignity, we can recognize the hard work they did and everybody else to build this territory in this state and this region, try to recover those stories and tell them through this work. I know you all are interested in this. I appreciate your attendance today and your interest in this. Thank you very much. Very good. I think we have a little time for questions. It's 1 o'clock. If you have to run back to work or things like that or to the boo, whatever I understand. <laughs> How did they transmit money to China? Good question. There are three major ways. And we think about how you can move around money today. It was a very <laughs> fluid situation. The first way was to send it with a returning relative. It was the most trustworthy way, but also the least 